This is a Thorium Energy Alliance Technology Talk from the inaugural Future of Energy Conference, October 2009. To find out more about Thorium Energy, please visit thoriumenergyalliance.com. This talk is from Dr. David LeBlanc of Carleton University, whose topic is Liquid Fluoride Reactors, a Luxury of Choice. Now, we can also go to what's called denatured cycle. We dilute the uranium with enough 238 to make it useless for weapons. Uh, because the pure cycle does, by definition, mean highly enriched uranium, for a lot of people, as soon as you say that term, it's a no-go. But we can run these denatured. Uh, we include enough 238 to make it useless for weapons. Uh, it gives us some problems. There's going to be more plutonium present, but it's still a very poor quality, and it's a lot harder to remove the plutonium. Uh, and including this will usually lower our conversion ratios a bit, but we can still break even. We can still do a lot of things here. Now, very quickly, I'm not, I don't have time to go into history, but uh, the molten salt reactor program at Oak Ridge, it started with the aircraft reactor program, a overly ambitious program to make a, a, a reactor for a bomber, so you could fly for months on end. Uh, but that led to a great deal of knowledge in molten salts in general. They first started, which, which are called sphere within sphere, just basically a tank of, uh, uh, of um, it was one and a half fluid, so thorium and uranium in the central tanks, surrounded by a tank. Uh, containing the thorium blanket. Uh, most of their work in the 60s, which was on this two-fluid graphite, uh, in that time they had a very su successful test reactor that ran for four or five years. Great results from that. Then in 1968 they switched to this single fluid design. They, they came up with a new processing that theoretically can work with the thorium present, but it, it does make it a lot more complicated. Then major funding cut for much more political reasons than anything else. There's a pretty major program in Fran France, they call it the Thorium Molten Salt Reactor. Uh, they've got rid of using molten salt of graphite moderation altogether. They have what's called just a radial, just around the edge um, thorium blanket, so it really makes it a one and a half fluid design. It's partial, it's a harder spectrum, no graphite, and they have they need a lot of U-233 to start up, which is a bit of a, a pain because uh, or plutonium to start, but it needs a lot. It has a pretty high breeding ratio and a very small salt volume of only 20 cubic meters. The uh, traditional was about 50. Uh, just quickly taking a look at this, it's a very simple container uh, that has the fuel salt, about 14 cubic meters of salt inside. The red zone is your fertile blanket zone, which is the fertile salt in some sort of material. You have end reflectors, they've been playing around with what material because it's in a pretty harsh environment here. Um, there's a lot of work being done in the, in the Czech Republic. They're really the experts on fluoride chemistry. There's always been a strong program in Russia. Uh, they've been more focused on using these just to burn transuranic waste. They're an excellent system for burning transuranic waste. We can put everything in, all the minor actinides. Don't have to worry about the isotopic uh, ratios, et cetera. Uh, and there's numerous groups in Japan, Netherlands, uh, Canada. Uh, UF, US efforts, not so much. And a lot of the, sort of the experts have switched to what's called liquid fluoride cool designs, using traditional uh, high temperature graphite triso fuels uh, cooled with molten salts. Molten salts in general are excellent coolants, probably the best on earth. And what I've been getting into, what ways can we make a good design even better? Some of the issues here, uh, the, oops, the reactivity coefficients with the re traditional design were not too good. The French group sort of found a little bit of a problem with them. Uh, the cost and complexity and image of fuel processing, what can we do about that? And then there's the real or imagined proliferation issues of the pure cycles. So some new ideas for your consideration, reviving the two-fluid two, two um, concept and a simple solution to the plumbing problem. That's what I really started with. Uh, but much more lately, I'm trying to sim I've always liked the simplest solution and I've really switched more of my research to what's, what's called simplified converter reactors. These do need low enriched uranium to keep going, but they're just so simple and cheap and little R&D, et cetera. That's what I've been focusing on. With a two fluid, the ideal, well, okay, well, we'll just have the, the fuel salt in the core and put a blanket around it. The problem is that core cannot be too big or it's going to be over critical. And it's always, if you have graphite, you don't have graphite, it's typically about a meter in di diameter. And that's just not big enough to get a lot of useful power, okay? So, um, and that's what I say here. If you don't have thorium in that salt, uh, it's too small for four power plants. The standard conclusion, well, we're going to have to use plumbing to interlace these two fluids and then put a blanket salt all around it. Uh, my very simple solution, uh, which I'm, well, patent pending, uh, is to go to cylindrical geometry and extend that. Now, what, the cylinder, if your sphere is about a meter, a cylinder that's long will be a little less than a meter for critical, but we can extend that to pretty long lengths to get a useful power out, okay? So we have an active core in the middle, blanket felt around it. If we sort of constrict that pipe, and that's really all your core is now is a pipe, uh, it's going to drive it subcritical, so we can get almost no neutron leakage at all. All those You get about half the neutrons that are produced in the core, half of them go to make the next fission, and about half go into the blanket to create 233, which we can simply remove and transfer to the, to the other. The new concept's advantages, we can use all the, the benefits of the two fluid without that plumbing problem, 
excellent reactivity coefficients for both the fuel and the blanket. Blanket salt coefficients did have some problem with Oak Ridge's designs. This should uh, have nicely negative as well, negative coefficients. Uh, no need for graphite in the core, simple transportable cores. It's very easy to model this. It's just you can almost do things in one dim dimension or 2D. Very low fissile inventory, which was true for pretty much any uh, two fluid design. Uh, and it's pretty easy to argue that we can get that, this down to about 400 kilograms per gigawatt for a large power plant. Now the key issue in the, all this work is confirming that barrier between the two. Uh, but of course we run the blanket salt at a little bit higher pressure, it's denser, it does that naturally. So any kind of leak or crack, it's just going to go into the central core and shut the reactor down. Any Oak Ridge would work on converter reactors. And the starting premise is here, they called it the 30 year once through design. They didn't do any process, they weren't going to do any processing of the fuel, just let the fusion products build up. You can, the salt can hold a lot of them for a full 30 year lifetime. Of course, we want a longer lifetime now. You start it up with low enriched uranium and then as much thorium as you can put in there to really improve the neutronics. So we go to the highest enrichment that's still low enriched or denatured 20%. Um, low power density, the core gives a full lifetime for the graphite. That's something we can, graphite's not that hard to replace, so we can go to higher density. Uh, pretty low starting fissile into about three and a half tons. That's lower than a light water reactor, and it's the same fuel they need, low enriched uranium. Better reactivity coefficients than the molten salt breeder, so there's no problem there. The French discovered a problem that's not an issue for these designs. And there's almost no R&D needed. Everything was done uh, by Oak Ridge. We can go with these pretty quick. Now, yes, we're using uranium, which is going a little bit away from the focus of this conference, but we don't need much of it. We need a lot less than light water reactor to need. In the whole lifetime, we need about 800 tons if we do nothing just once through cycle, compared to about 6,400 tons for a light water reactor, about 5,000 tons for can do. Now, at the end of the 30 year, when the salt's finished, we can also easily remove the uranium and just use it in the next salt, okay, in the next core. And if you do that, you get down to under 1,000 tons uh, lifetime. We're getting to uh, the utilization in a PWR is about half a percent of what comes out of the ground because some of it goes out in the enrichment tail, some of it goes out in the waste in the spent fuel. We're getting up to like three or four percent. Transuranics can also be recycled. That's sort of a national decision. I definitely would like to see them. And we have about a ton of transuranics in the salt at the end of 30 years. And if we assume that same 0.1 percent processing loss, that's one kilogram going to waste in 30 years. Now it's got the ultimate in proliferation resistance. I can't imagine anything, any kind of reactor design that's better. There's no fuel, fuel processing equipment we need. The uranium is never usable for weapons. There is more plutonium there, but it's very low quality and very dilute and highly radioactive salt, and it's very hard to remove the plutonium from the salt. If we can go to a higher power density, uh, that has like maybe half the, the salt volume and replace the graphite every 15 years. Lower starting inventory, better uranium utilization. We can get that thousand tons lifetime even down. Using graphite pebbles as a moderator, Oak Ridge always had sort of our plan B is instead of graphite logs, let's go with pebbles. They're a lot easier to work with, a lot easier to manufacture, but they didn't give quite as high a breeding ratio, so it was always a second choice for them. You might imagine, well, let's just make a big tank of salt. There's problems with that, the U238 resonances. It really makes it, you can do it, but you probably need a pretty high fissile load. Uh, I'm also quite excited about alternate carrier salts. Uh, we need enriched lithium. We, it should not be very expensive. It's very simple to enrich lithium, uh, but that could still be a bit of a, a bottleneck for development. There's a lot of other carrier salts that aren't quite as good neutronically, but we're not trying to break even or breed anymore. Uh, if we just lower the conversion ratio a bit, a bit, that's not much of a penalty. So there's a lot of others, uh, sodium uh, and beryllium, it's a lot lower cost, low melting point. If we lower the operating point, we might be able to get by with simple stainless steels instead of nickel alloys. Again, I'm talking about using uranium. That's almost being a heretic here at a thorium con conference. Uh, but we don't need very much of it. Now, if we imagine uh, there is a shortage of uranium, we have to pay a lot more. We can go up to like $5,000 per kilogram. Then I'm sure the folks at Cominco can tell us there's plenty of uranium then. For a light water reactor, you need a lot of it. That's getting into like a billion dollars a year. That's just way too much money. But we need so little for these denatured molten salt reactors. Even at $5,000 a kilogram, you're only talking about two cents a kilowatt hour for your fueling costs. So some conclusions here, molten salts or liquid flower designs, they have inherent features that, that favor all, overall safety, waste reduction, low cost, rapid deployment. Um, especially with the two fluid, we can actually start these on low enriched uranium, which you can on the single fluid. Didn't have time to get into that. Uh, there's also great flexibility to deal with varying priorities or what you feel is the most important. Um, we can attain the highest levels of proliferation resistance. They're high already. We can make them enormously, uh, enormous barriers to proliferation by some of these other designs. So traditionally, we can run, run a minute amount of thorium. It's almost free, okay? It's like $50,000 a year. You're making hundreds of millions of dollars from the electricity sale. It's basically free or modest amounts of uranium. And again, that's not free anymore, but it's still very, very inexpensive. Um, yeah, so that was all I really wanted to talk about or really had time to. So um, looking forward to questions or chatting later on all this work. And again, I'm sort of just skimming through a lot of these. Thank you.